and then send a link to it. Uh, which group? We're live. Um, are you on the group? Welcome everyone who's watching in person and live and the recording. I'm so excited. It's been a long time coming for this course. Um, we've been talking about it for years, ever since we had this weekly coffee and Kabbalah Parsha group, which is also on our channel. Um, we start covering different topics in Hasidus throughout the class. They come up in the Parsha, all these Hasidic ideas and concepts like Klippa, um, the levels of our soul, the two souls, um, is the you know the concentration of the world or memale or sovev or these familiar ratzo yeshuv right and while we brief bitzel it's yes meitzarim trachav et zayinga enod milvado these are just like some of the topics what a benoni is um, even mostly we talk about like the, pri the prior worlds that broke and the spheros right chesed glory to Christ we talk about all these things but we really never have um, enough time in the class to go in depth in these ideas I will briefly summarize in two three minutes something that fills the books of Hasidus that takes hours and hours to learn. So I felt that it was about time that we finally are able to start a night class. You can see that it's quiet now. My kids are sleeping, so we can start an evening class and we can get into the Hasidic concepts as concepts, not learning them just to understand the Parsha, but actually learning these Hasidic ideas so we can live with them because they really changed my life. You know, I'm so lucky to have this. Even, you know, the Hasidus view on Teshuvah, Misimcha, and when it means to have a relationship with Hashem and all that. So without further delay, Let's dive. Do you, do you have the link? Are you on the Tanya one one group? Yeah, yeah. Okay, great. So, ooh, I wanted to link. I linked uh, on the group, um, the WhatsApp group, I linked the PDF to the sources. It's not necessary for the class. It's just a nice hand along. So today, the first thing we're going to talk about before we learn the concepts of Chassidus, on the top of my head, I made a list of 40 concepts of Chassidus that I've always wanted to dive deeper in, and I never had a chance to in the weekly classes. So I included them on this sheet, and I will link it the PDF. In the, am I able to link a PDF in the comments or link? No, I can only send an online link. I'll have to link it on our website. So um, I could put pictures. No. Oh, cool. No, the group is, yeah, the group is on it. So I took 40 concepts. Um, that was just on the top of my head that I thought about and sitting in one sitting. Um, so before we get into what the concepts are, we want to for all those who, for everyone who's um, new to this or not new, what is Hasidus? Most of us, um, even this is a course on a workshop on understanding what Kabbalah is, what Hasidus is, what are we even talking about, what Tanya is, right? Tanya is the earliest first book of Chabad Hasidus. But we first want to understand what Hasidus is before we understand what Chabad Hasidus is. And Hasidus is really uh, Kabbalah in a short nutshell. Hasidus is Kabbalah. Um, explained for everybody because Kabbalah is something that very few people can understand and Hasidus is Kabbalah um, explained with Mishalim and examples and, and it's basically Kabbalah brought down with real life examples that anyone can understand and tap into to live with um, and Chabad Hasidus is a branch of Hasidus that in that doesn't just give over emotions and feelings of love for Hashem rather it actually teaches the Kabbalistic secrets of the Torah themselves and so we want to understand what is Kabbalah where does it come from the origins of Kabbalah um, so that's what we're going to talk about today and break it down. Not just that, it's going to be really deep. I don't think we'll cover all of it today, but I would like to cover today in the first course or part one before we even go into the concepts. And even in this part one, we will still cover concepts in Hasidus. Um, so the first thing we'll talk about after we finish part one of what is Kabbalah, what is Hasidus, what is Kabbalah Hasidus, what is Tanya. Once we cover that, we're probably going to start with the, where it all began, with the creation of the world, with the Simpsom, right? Simpsom itself is a huge idea. Before the world was created, there was Simpsom, right? And then there was four levels of worlds, the four almost the worlds, at Silo, Spirit, Sierra, Sia. Then, right, what are those worlds? What do they look like? And then there's the Spheros that were brought into those worlds, right? And there was the Kav, that, which are the Spheros. And then there's a leftover, a Rishimu, left in there, right? We said that's the feminine. And the Kav is the arrow of the masculine. Um, then there was worlds before that. There was other worlds, right? There were worlds Hashem created that shattered. And then there's sparks that fell from those worlds into our world. So we're going to start from the beginning, beginning, like from the void, the black void that Hashem created or the dark void of nothingness. And from there, the world Hashem created prior. And from there, we really get the deepest Kabbalistic ideas. So stay tuned for that. For part one, we want to learn, we're going to start from the beginning. Kabbalah is one of the four levels of Torah that was um, imparted from Hashem to Moshe when he gave him the Torah. Hashem gave Moshe the Torah, he gave him the written Torah. And within the written Torah included four levels or layers um, of the, in every, in, included in every single word, in every verse in the Torah. Those levels are actually, um, are summarized by an acronym, and that is on the second page of the source sheet, Pardes. Pardes is a Hebrew word that means orchard. Um, but Pardes is also an acronym for the four levels of Torah that Hashem gave to us. Um, at Har Sinai, gave to Moshe, and Moshe gave to us. And they are an acronym for these four words, Pei and Pardes, 
is pshat, um, the literal meaning, the simple meaning of the text. Um, so I'll give you some examples in a moment. Um, for example, yeah, let's get to that moment. Um, first, so pshat is the pay. Then after pshat, we have the reish in pardes. Remet, reish stands for remez. Remez is what you allude when you read between the lines, right? What I'm not saying directly, but I'm saying, but I'm saying without saying, right? Um, like it's hot in here. What I'm saying is, can you close the, can you mind opening a door, right? What I'm hinting to. So rem, that's really what a rem is, is. Rem is means a hint. So there's pshat, what I'm literally saying, the rem is what I'm hinting to, right? So I'm literally saying it's hot in here, but I'm hinting if you can close the, open the door or if, if it's, or it's more obvious if it's the window's open and the door's open and I'm saying I'm freezing. So I'm literally saying that I'm freezing. What I'm hinting to be the lines is, can someone close the door? Um, the next level is Dalit, the next um, letter, hard days, Peresh, Dalit, and Samach. Dalit is Drush, which comes from Medrish. Um, so it's the homiletic or homiletic interpretive meaning. Um, Medrish and Drush are the same thing. Drush is what is not explicit in the text. It's the not so explicit direct hint. It's what's a little bit deeper. So we're going actually four layers deeper. So the, lay the four, soon Pesach's coming up, this concept of four is going to come up a lot in Kabbalah. So Pesach is very Kabbalistic in that we have the four suns and they allude to the four worlds, the four levels. So there, there's a there's um, a four dimensional, there's a certain type of four dimensional aspect to our world that we live in because our world is reflective of the four higher worlds that we're going to talk about later. And Pardes reflects those four worlds, right? The world of Asiya, the physical world that we live in is the Pshat, world of Pshat, the level of above Asiya, um, which is Yitzira form is like, you know, it's not physical, but it's Form. It's hinted to there. Above that is the less tangible, the world of soul. So there's the world of physicality, there's the world of form, there's the world of angels, Bria, which is the world of Medrash. And then there's the world of Atsilos, which is like Kabbalah, the level of Kabbalah. So Sod, so we have Pei, Reish, Dalet, Pardes. The last letter in Pardes is Samach, which stands for Sod, secret. Um, it's kind of cool because like the Samach is closed. It, it, it's covering up what's inside of it. Secrets are the seek to the Torah, the Kabbalistic aspects. So all the first level shot is the written words of the Torah. Remez um, is what Rashi, it's like with the between the lines, what you get, what you understand without it saying, goes without saying that this is what it means. Um, medrash is what we have, which is, you know, we all, we're all given all those three levels. Medrash, we have many Medrashim that fill in the backstory. Medrash fills in what we weren't told exactly, right? It's like, I'm telling you, like, I went to Florida. I'm not telling you that I went to the airport and I got on a plane, right? But there's some things that you would know and some things you wouldn't know that I'm not including. And the Medrash is what was, that's really the oral Torah. So Pshad is the written Torah. So um, Remez and Drush is the oral Torah. It's that Hashem gave to Moshe that was then later on written down, which wasn't written down initially. And Kabbalah was given to Moshe as well. Kabbalah were the secrets. And that wasn't given for Moshe to teach everybody. So while Moshe taught everybody the Pshad of the Torah, the written Torah and the oral Torah, and it was kept passed down from person to person, Kabbalah wasn't for Moshe to tell everybody. Kabbalah, and that's why it's called Sod. So Sod is the level of the Kabbalistic secrets, which were passed down only for Moshe to very select few. There's actually the history, the transmission of Kabbalah. Um, Arya Ras, Arya Kaplan has uh, amazing, phenomenal books on it and essays, and it could be even found online. So there is a transmission of Kabbalah. Kabbalah means to receive. So this Sod, the secret, Hashem said, okay, so here's what I'm going to write down. Here's what you're going to explain to everybody, right? I can't write down all the explanations. And I and, and Shem intentionally wrote the Torah. For example, he said, you should wear it as a sign between your eyes. And Shem explained to Moshe, what do I mean by that? I mean that you should write down these words of Bat Shema in parchment and put them in boxes and they should wear it on their head, which is parallel between their eyes. That's the oral Torah. That was a tradition that Moshe said and later was written down by the Chachamim so that it wouldn't be forgotten once Jews were dispersed amongst the world. So there was the Torah that's explicitly written that we don't that, that we can read and learn with Moshe. Then there was the oral tradition explaining what the Torah means. What's halacha? What's not halacha? Is this, you know, what does this mean to put it on our doorposts, right? Are we writing on our doorposts? Are we portaling in the parchment, right? We can't have the oral Torah. So there, there, we couldn't give, be given the, the, the um, Torah, the written Torah without the oral Torah, without Psha and Medrash, um, um, without Ramaz and Medrash, but Sod is another layer. It's the it's it's the secrets of why why Hashem did everything that He did. It's the reasons for everything. It's the very deep personal reasons of Hashem for everything. Right? That Hashem didn't tell everybody. Hashem said, "I'm telling you this, Moshe, but this is not for you to tell everybody at all." First of all, they will not get it. It's God's secrets, right? Like Moshe could talk to God. Most people can't. Um, and second of all, it's not for them. It'll only cause more damage and harm, right? Same reason. And, and we'll get into why it wasn't revealed. So this, Hashem told Moshe, he can choose, you know, those people in every generation who are, you know, on the highest level to be able to receive the secrets of Hashem. Make sure that it's Kabbalah, that someone receives it. And that before they die, they pass it on to someone. They have students that they teach these secrets, right? They find, and that's what happened over the generations. Um, you know, they they would the people would appear like a, a Chia Shiloni appealed to the Baal Shem Tov or, or and taught him these secrets that were given 
Um, some people were like well, enough appear to them and 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 would teach them these secrets. But these secrets were definitely kept to a select few in every generation um, until. Kabbalah was revealed to a lot of Kabbalistic secrets were revealed to more than just a select few with the passing of Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai and Lag Omer, And that's why it's a day of light, a day of celebrating the fire. Um, Lag is like Gal, also like to Revelation. So it's a day that he revealed to us many secrets of the Kabbalistic text in the Zohar that was revealed to us. Nevertheless, the Zohar was so um, obscure and hidden and hard to understand. It was like telling you a secret in code. It doesn't really help you. If you find my secret diary, but it's in code, I mean, it's great, but it, it wouldn't really affect you. You wouldn't know anything about my secrets anyway. So it was still encoded. It was given in a way that only those who are on that level to receive it can truly understand it. And those who wouldn't, wouldn't understand it anyways. So it wasn't fully revealed. It was revealed still in a way to, only to those who can access it. It was real to anyone who was on the level to access it. Um, and there was not a lot of like rules at that time about accessing these deep secrets. You have to be 40 years old. You have to be at a certain level, right? Because if you learn it the wrong way, these deep secrets, right? It can cause more harm than damage. There's a reason Hashem kept a secret all along, right? Remember when my father turned 40, he ordered a set of Zohar. And he had it sent to the house. No way. That is incredible. Uh -huh. I remember as a kid, like, stuck in my head. I hope people can chat. Someone can say hi. That's why I know that you could, um, um, I can see your chat. If anyone has a question, I just want to make sure I can see you. And even just say hi so I can see who's watching. I know who I'm talking to. Um, and hopefully it'll pop up for me and hopefully chats are allowed. Okay. Okay. Oh, cool. I can make a poll. Oh, I see. There's hi. There's someone named Michal here. But there's a lot of Michals I know. But hello and there welcome. Is Zoom link. There is no Zoom link. There's for this week. Next week, there'll be a more interactive Zoom link. But for this week, all I could figure out was the YouTube link. Okay. So now we have Pardes. So now we know where Kabbalah is. So Kabbalah is the secrets of Torah, which are the secrets of God. We literally like God's secrets, intentions in every single aspect of the Torah and the creation of the world, you know, and we know in Kabbalah, for example, how Hashem made the world, why the reason for creating the world, the higher world, what's happening in the higher worlds in the parallel universes. Now, people ask a lot of times, like where, which level, it's hard to understand that when we're learning Torah, we're learning all levels can exist at the same time. That when we're learning Torah, there's not just one layer to it. We understand that we are now, now as older people, right? We understand that we are very layered people. That I can say one thing. It doesn't have to mean that I, which one do I mean? Is this Pshat? And often people are like, well, the Medrash goes against the Pshat, right? Which one is it? One Medrash is one thing. Pshat is another thing. But we understand that often there's more than one thing going on at the same time. First of all, we can say something and mean two different things at the same time. Um, two different things. They don't have to contradict one another. I can be saying one thing and there's so many levels and layers what i'm saying my classic example that i like to that i that, that like resonated for me is um if my if i tell my husband um i'm really thirsty so that has so much layers to it so i'm sitting i'm sitting on the couch my husband's like on the other side of the couch he's on his phone right and i'm saying i'm thirsty so on shot level i'm saying i'm actually thirsty that's true i am thirsty right on Rema's level, I'm hinting to him, like, honey, I'm really, really, really thirsty, right? So what am I hinting to him? If you can please get me some water, right? I'm waiting for him, hinting to see if he'll all take the hint and be like, honey, would you like some water? And I'll say, sure, dear, right? <laughs> yes, please. Um, so that's the hint. One doesn't negate the other. They're both true. I am thirsty. And I'm also saying to Rema, if, if you do mind getting me some water, you know, I'm just letting you know, son, I'm really thirsty. I've been drunk the whole day, right? The medrash would be like the backstory. What's behind this, right? So the backstory, I would say, is like, well, I'm, why am I really thirsty? Well, I just came back from a run and I'm exhausted and I like just sat down on the couch for the first time today, right? That's the medrash. It's like, doesn't negate it. It's just filling in more of the details of why I'm so thirsty, what I did today. I'm overwhelmed, right? There's so much going on. Then I, that would be like the medrash coming in and saying, well, she sat down because she was thirsty because today she had this, you know, trip to the desert and there was, she lost her water bottle on the way, right? It would be like this cra crazy medrash story happened and then someone came and stole her last drop of water and now she came home and also her foot hurts, right? That's all the backstory. That's medrash. And again, it doesn't negate, they're all true. I'm thirsty. I wanted to get me water and all that happened. And the so the secret, what I'm not saying, what I'm, what I'm not saying, but I'm really, the deeper thing is that I don't really need the water. That's not the reason I'm telling you. I could get the water myself technically. What I'm truly saying is I want you to connect with me, right? Like I want your attention. Like I want you to be with me. You're on your phone or you're distracted. Like we should reconnect now, right? So I'm saying get me water. But what I'm really saying is like check in. I want to connect with you, right? I'm reaching out for connection. That is for me, so like really was so powerful because they're all true, right? So we can do a mitzvah on so many levels. On the one hand, yes, do this good deed. It's good to do, right? Just do it. It's the right thing to do. On the other hand, you're also doing like, you're also, it's also alluding to the higher hand. When you give to Dukkah, you're, you know, you're connecting to the hand above, right? 
there's, well, that's really, um, you're also, you know, helping your soul and the person's soul because they need the money, but it's also good for your soul because it uplifts you at the same time, right? There's so much more to it. And also, you know, it could be like a whole story, right? You know, like the Arbi Kiva's daughter who gave tzedakah to the poor person and then she saved her whole life, right? There's so much more going on that we don't even know that's going on. And there's so many layers of the things we do. And the soda is like, Hashem is saying, yes, I want you to do this. But even more than that, I want you to connect to me. Because when I ask you to do something for me, that builds connection. When my husband brings me water, that that's what a connection is. When I you know, make dinner for my husband or do other things that other things that I do um, actually do. That's what connection is doing something for you. So yes, I'm making a dinner. Yes, he's hungry, but I'm also, it's also an act of connection and also an act of bonding. And that's, you know, the deeper Hashem is saying, I need you. I want you to connect with me. These mitzvahs are the way we can connect because I'm God. How can we relate? But if you do mitzvahs, we can connect somehow, right? If you do these, you know, these, these, these close, these moments of closeness, this davening, right? It's for you, but it's also for me. There's so many layers to it. This is just one aspect of party. So now we understand what party is. There's the famous story in the Gemara of, it says four people who entered Pardes, right? There's a, it's, it's a famous Gemara. It says four people entered Pardes. One died. One went crazy. One um, never came out, right? And one um, came out with all the knowledge. So what does that mean? They say, what does it mean? They entered an orchard, right? The Gemara says, no, this means that they entered the four levels of Torah. They entered Pardes is an allusion to Sod, really. When you say they entered Pardes, it means they went to the last level. They weren't just remaining in the parts that we all have, the level they got to the secrets of Torah. It means four people entered into the secrets of Torah, into the Zohar, into these Kabbalistic deep secrets of God and understanding, you know, like getting to know, know God and not God's intentions on some level. And one person, and then Kamara goes and explains why one person, you know, he wasn't able to handle it. His soul just, you know, was expired from the revelation. He couldn't handle it. his soul, fled his body, right? It was like, I, I got to go back to God, right? One person, right, he just died. One person went crazy. It made him nuts. He was just like, this is everything. This is crazy. Maybe we don't, we don't understand. The Kamara goes and explains why each person on their level reacted the way they did. I think Rabbi Kiva, it says only one, Nichnas B'Shalom, Yatza B'Shalom. He went in with peace from a good place, from a from a place ready to receive the right to receive the secrets and yatsa b'shalom. So, anyways, I'm, I, I believe it was Rabbi Akiva. It was maybe it was Rabbi four students of Rabbi Akiva or four students of Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai. Who who was a student of who? Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai was a Talmud of Rabbi Akiva. Um, and I think maybe Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai. That's a, one of them was a student of one of them. One of them came out b'shalom. I'm sorry. I will I will try to remember it. Um, um, Hi, Monica from Hawaii. Oh, that's exciting. Um, hi, T. Ferret. So the that's just a little bit on what it means, nichnas, but parties. Now, if you hear the word parties, you'll know it means going into the secrets of the Torah, going into the deep secrets of the Torah that were transmitted only from Moshe, um, from person to person or group of select few to select few, even after the Rosh Hashanah revealed it. Um, how many years ago? Let me look this all up. Um, it was still not revealed to the masses because it was inaccessible. No one could understand it. To go into parties was just impossible. So it was like the coding. It, was un it wasn't coded. It wasn't decoded yet. So that is where Kabbalah came in. So Kabbalah was meant to remain a secret. Now, fast forward hundreds or thousands of years later to the era of the Baal Shem Tov. That's where the era of Hasidus began. So the era, descendants, what? Direct Your direct descendants of the Baal Shem Tov? That's crazy. Yeah, that's amazing. Wow. That's amazing, Sarah. Wow. So fast forward, the heir of the Baal Shem Tov, the Baal Shem Tov decides, and now is the time for the world to access the secrets that were secret until now. I want to spill the secrets, right? So the Baal Shem Tov then reveals small bits of the secrets of the Torah to everybody. And he says, we need this. This is a time when the world is in this, um, in a very dark and low place, and they need these secrets to survive them. Otherwise, Judaism and connection to Hashem will disappear forever. It was a very, very low time for the Jewish people. And the Baal Shem Tov came and revived and began, and there was so much opposition. We're reading stories to my kids on this book called Once Upon a Journey in English. Um, it's the memoirs of the previous rabbis. It's, it's unbelievable book. Um, it's actually like fairy tales, but they actually happen in real life. It's, it's interest princesses and kings, and, and these are real stories. Um, anyways, I'm on tangents. But the the... Baal Shem Tov in his generation, oh my gosh, find me the date of the Baal Tov. Someone, what can you look up when the Baal Shem Tov, what year, the English year? Of the Baal Shem Tov what? Like when he, when he, when he lived, yeah, his era. How many years ago is this? I would like to say like between three and 500 years ago, right? In like the 400 years ago? Right, it was just the, it was just his 300th birthday. It was a student of Rebbe. About 300 years ago, the Baal Shem Tov decided now it's time to reveal some of these secrets. So he took a few of the secrets of Hashem, of the Torah, and he said it's time to share a little bit of the secrets, not to reveal the whole secret. It would be like he would share Hasidus in a way that it was, um, you should know that when you do a mitzvah, it's not just. Um, he lived from 1698 to 1760. 
1698 to 1768. Wait, so that's how many years ago? 18, 18 so less than 300 years ago? Four hundred years ago. No. Three hundred. About three hundred years ago. Less. About three hundred. Okay. So the Baal Shem Tov began to reveal the deeper, the Less deeper messages of the Torah. For example, um, in that era, people were very um, segregated by class. Their well, the knowledgeable people who were knowledgeable in Torah, the Torah scholars, were respected, and the simple people who had to work to make a living, they were, they didn't have a time to learn Torah. There was no schools for them. They were young. They started. They were able to work. They would go milk the cows and just scrape by enough to make a living, right? In the good old days. So they weren't knowledgeable at all. Many of them could barely read Hebrew, and they were looked down upon and had very little respect. And the Baal Shem Tov came and revealed secrets and said, "Do you know that the Amen Yeheshmi Rabbah brings of a simple Jew who can barely read Hebrew brings more pleasure to Hashem than all the Torah that you read?" And he would explain why. Right? This is what the creation. This is what Hashem wants. All He wants is to connect with you, with your purity, with your simplicity. There's all the stories, and that's one of the main things the Baal Shem Tov brought. Up. There's very few teachings we have the Baal Shem Tov because he wasn't going to spill all the secrets because they're secrets. But he would share. You should know, right, that Hannah really wants to connect with you. I'm not going to tell you the details, right, like with your, you know, I would go to your husband and be like, I just, or, you know, so my, someone would say to my husband, your wife really wants to connect with you. I'm not going to say too much. I'm not going to spill too much of the secrets because, you know, like I'm not going to share everything. It was, in, it was said in confidence, but I'm just letting you know there's much more than you that, that to that story than you know, right? You're judging that person um, for, for lots of things, but there's more to it than you know. And the Baal began to reveal Hasidus in that way. So he took these secrets of Kabbalah and explained it in a way to the simplest people. He would revive and nourish these people and say, you don't know how much joy it brings Hashem for you to bring the Shekhinah down into this world. That in the things that you do, you can take and find godliness. You don't have to be learning Torah all day to be godly. You can be a shepherd. You can be a blacksmith. You can be a silversmith. Whatever, what else? What other jobs existed then that don't exist now? You can be a tailor, a cobbler, um, a tin, a tin <laughs> And in your in your work, that's when you can bring Hashem into that space, when you can use your money and give it to Hashem, you give tzedakah, you know, that brings so much infinite joy to Hashem. You would teach him about emunah, to have faith, about how pleasurable, how he would teach every person to say Baruch Hashem, to thank Hashem for everything, and how much joy and satisfaction it gave in that relationship with Hashem, how much it strengthened that. And he really um, helped people realize that the Torah scholars were not as great as they thought they were, and it has nothing to do with how much you know, it's how much you can apply it in real life. It's how good of a person you are. It's how much you can translate that into Abbas Yisrael. And he would say that if you can learn everything in the world, but you don't love another Jew, right? It means nothing. So he really taught a lot more than, than just the Torah and explanations of the mitzvahs, right? He was like, there are so many more layers. And he understood because of the secrets of the Torah. And we understand the secrets. We see why does Shem even make the world? It wasn't just so you can <laughs> do the checklist of these mitzvahs. It was because there's so much more going on in the higher world. So Kabbalah will come and teach what is going on. So Kabbalah is very different than Hasidus. Kabbalah will explain what is going on in the higher world when a person does something down here. When we're doing things down here, we're affecting these letters, these worlds, these names of Hashem, these Sfirot, right? These high and lofty things, which don't really connect to us in a day-to-day -day way. And Hasidus would take that and bring that down and say, well, what does that mean practically? What it means is that giving tzedakah each and every time is not just about giving tons of money. And it's also about your act of every time you put one penny in the tzedakah box, each time you do that, you're creating connections and bridges to Hashem. And you would teach things like that. Um, so that was what Hasidus was. When Hasidus came to the world, there was so much opposition. People thought he was crazy. They thought he was um, like um, a missionary. He was coming to like missionize people, that he was coming from like evil places. He was coming to take people away from Torah. He wasn't saying true Torah. And people didn't understand for a long time until they met him in person, until they met the Baal Shem Tov in person. And then they understood that he's really teaching actual Torah. They're like, don't listen to him. You're not allowed to go to him. If you go to him, you can never come back, right? There was like, it caused a big uproar because this was new for the first time. No one had ever learned these things. It was new concepts. The main, some of the main things, Hashkacha Pratis, right? Living with Hashem, that the Hashem, that everything we do has intention, has meaning that, um, Every act that we do, even if it's mundane, that Jewish, non-Jewish, in every person, there's a spark of God. All these ideas that God creates the world nonstop, these were crazy. And they're like, this guy's nuts. You cannot go to him. This is not Torah, right? He's and, and eventually he became accepted after many people met him face to face, after his students would come to places and they would say, go to him themselves. Um, and, and eventually he really revived the world and brought people up to realize they can have a connection to Hashem, even if they can't learn Torah all day, right? Even if they can't even dive in, you can still connect to Hashem. So that is... So let me Let me redefine. Um, let me define or summarize what we said so far. So we said that there's four levels in Torah. Shat, Remez, and Dresh were given to everybody, where Moshe taught all of us Shat and then the meanings of the mitzvot and meanings of Torah and the backstories. And so it was only given to a select few. The first revelation of it was what by the Rashi. And then, but that was still decoded. And the Baal Shem Tov decoded that. 
for us 300 years ago, he decoded some of it, very little bits of it. The work of we have the Baal Shem Tov would fill one, we have it, it's of us, there's two books, there's Tzavah Sarivash, um, the Tzavah, his will of the Rivash, which is Rabbi Sral Baal Shem Tov, and we have Keser Shem Tov, that's it. Um, that in my, in my, and to my knowledge, that's the only things we have. They're very small books, right? In English, there's one book that I know of, 18 teachings of the Baal Shem Tov. It's this tiny pamphlet by Rabbi Freeman, right? There's not that much we have. Now, Chazadis Chabad, so after the Baal Shem Tov taught Chazadis, he um, sent um, students everywhere to go teach, to spread Chazadis to every corner of the world. And that is where the, they, the, the like, Shulchan started. Shulchan started, Shulchan of sending and spreading Chazadis, which is why I live here, right, to teach Chazadis. That started from the Baal Shem Tov, because there's a famous story that he went up to heaven and he begged Mashiach and said, just come already, right? The world is chaotic. Imagine then, right? It was so dark and chaotic. And now, just fast forward, it's just getting more and more it's just more and more scary as we go along. He said, when are you coming? And he said, when you spread the wellsprings, the Mayan itself, not just the water. Don't just spread the water. Of Chassidus. I want the wellsprings to be there. I want the source of the water, the source of Torah to be brought to every single place. Um, and that began the Tanya campaign to not just bring Tanya's everywhere, but to have them printed. And in this room, literally where I'm sitting right now, Tanya's were printed because Tanya is like the you know, where the most wellsprings we have in Chabad Chassidus. And so this guy called us one day, the first year we moved here, five years ago, and he said um, he's on this like campaign to spread the wellsprings everywhere in every Chabad house around the world. Do you want a printing press to come to your house and print a Tanya in your Chabad house? Because this, this is our Chabad house. And we were like, sure. And like the next day he showed up. It cost maybe like a few hundred, like a 700 shekel or like was subsidized. He came with a printing press. He printed a hundred Tanyas and then and then bound them somewhere else and brought them back to us. And we have a couple copies. We gave them out at our first Yitzhak Kislev. And we still have like a bunch of copies. Um, very, they say like Chabad Zagan, they're printed here. So that's like that's like how some people took, the Rebbe like took that once to spread the wellsprings. So spreading the wellsprings means that there should be a teacher of Chassidus spread to teach and be a continuous wellspring of Chassidus everywhere, right? Until they on their own become a wellspring and can spread Chassidus. And that's when Mashiach will come, when every corner of the world has been illuminated. And Chassidus is really taking a dark room that everything is already there. It's not teaching something new. It's taking a room that's dark. Let me see if I can turn the light off. <laughs> Let's see. Um, a dark room, right? And then just turning on a light bulb to illuminate and to reveal what is there. Hashem's presence is everywhere, right? Everyone has. It's not like Hashem, he brought, said, put a spark of God inside of us that we didn't have. He just told us, every single one of you, no matter how far you are, has a piece of godliness, a piece of soul inside of you. And there's very many layers to that soul. And if you don't feel it, it's there. And every human being and every object and every cup has a spark of godliness in it. And everything that's happening to you, it's happening from God, right? It's not that person. They're not that person's not screaming at you because you know it was because they decided to. They did decide to, but it was all divine plan from Hashem. And you know, don't get angry at them. Hashem wants this to happen to you. It's revealing what was already there. All of the flow of energy is all from Hashem. It's just we need to connect to it and reveal it. That's really what Adar is all about, right? Plug for the Adar class, but. This is other class. Understand that fish, you know, we're just disconnected from our source, whereas our fishy friends <laughs> are constantly in their source. They they see their water source, right? We just don't see that at the source. We're not always constantly feeling and conscious of the fact that our life source comes from God and comes from Hashem, right? There's so many things between it blocking us, veils. So Chassidus comes and illuminates. He's like, when everything is illuminated with this light of, of Chassidus, then Mashiach will come, right? When And really, it's not like then Mashiach will say, okay, now I can come. The truth is, is that when everything is illuminated, that is Mashiach. Mashiach only, it merely is the same world that we're in, live in the Rambam said. It's not a different world. It's not a different reality. It's the same reality with the lights turned on. When everyone is conscious, there'll be no more war, no more race, no more hatred. When Imagine everyone, every single person, all the people causing hatred, you know, between all of the nations, we're constantly aware that, you know, my land is, this is, I'm here because God put me here. God put you here. You're here. I wouldn't fight with you or be jealous of you if you opened up my business next door, because I know that. I can just see what is already there. Not, it's not a difference. It's just turning the light bulb on. If I was constantly aware and plugged in to the secrets of the world, a secrets of existence, that my flow is coming to me and that has nothing to do with, if you can open up a thousand stores near me and I'm still going to get exactly what I was meant to get. It's not going to take away from my influence, right? I'm not going to get any more or any less. And even if, you know, someone had a bad day and yelled at me, whatever happened to me would have happened to me with or without them, right? So I, there would be no jealousy, no hatred, no rivalry, because I would say, okay, someone bought my house, right? Someone come in and bought, if I was tuned in all the time to Chassidus, and someone came in and bought my house and said, you have to go, I would say, okay, like, it's not like you took my house. I, I wasn't meant to be here, right? If I can see what was, that Hashem has a different plan for me, that, you know, this is, this Hashem is just, has a different, you know, store, something in store for me, I wouldn't be so painful. Nothing would be painful. And that's, um, 
yeah, that's, we can talk about this more about pain and knowing the reason takes away a lot of the pain. When we can see the purpose for something, the pain is so much less. When we know that there's a reason, right? Some birth is not, I mean, birth is painful, but knowing that there's a baby coming, um, or as you know, um, it, it takes, it, it makes it not like, we're not like, stop this, make it go away. We're like, no, no, just like, let's just get this on with, right? Pain, when we understand the reason for it is not something we would fight against and yell at the doctor and be like, what are you doing to me? Like, take these things off of me. Like, stop cutting me open. Like, why are you cutting me open? You murderer, right? Well, we know that he's taking the baby out, right? But without that knowledge, we could just be yelling and suing and like going and maybe killing him, right? But with the knowledge, we're like, oh, he's just, you know, he's just doing what he's meant to do. He's, so there's a lot that changes when we have that awareness. So it's really, in truth, the when every corner of the world is illuminated with the secret that everything is, when we can see that every, where everything comes from, that everything comes from God, that is what Mashiach is. Nothing will have to, that will be, there'll be a time of peace, a time of plenty, a time of, you know, of everyone being one. We can see that there are no barriers between us. We're all just, you're my hand, right? I would never be hurt my own hand, so I would never hurt you because we're all part of the same, we're all one. And the truth is that every single Every single human is one. We're all part of one cosmic thing, but we feel so separate from one another. We wouldn't hurt our own hand. We wouldn't hurt our own body, right? Because it's me. That would be crazy. But we don't, we forget that we we can't really see clearly that truth of reality that really all just one. I would never hurt you because that would be hurting me. Um, so, so that's what Hasidus came in to illuminate the world. Now, fast forward. So the Baal Shem Tov was succeeded by his student, the Magid of Mezrich. He's the one that wrote the Tanya? No, the no. no. So we're almost, we're almost up to the Baal Tanya. Okay, then the he Balatanya, was succeeded right. by the, his student, the Alta Rabbi, the Mor Zakein of Shneir Zalman of Liadi. Because that's where he lived. They didn't have last names, right? So Shneir Zalman of Liadi, he was one of the students of the Magid. But the Magid wasn't succeeded by one person. The Magid students, the Baal Shem Tov was succeeded. He passed on his mantle to the to the Magid. They continue teaching his Hasidus even more. We have more teachings of the Magid. And in a similar way to the Baal Shem Tov, you know, spreading. And he had many students who took on their different takes of the te of their teacher and went around to different communities. And they moved and they talked to the stairs. They became their own rebbes. And when he passed away, the Baal Shem Tov, the Alter Rebbe, took like the main leadership, well, took on the main leader. But all of his students became their own rebbes. And that's where all of the different Hasidic sects began. We have Rav Nachman of Breslov was one of his students and that's why he moved to Breslov and that's his branch of Hasidim. Rabbi of Karlin began their branch of Hasidim, the Slanim Rebbe and the Piatsna Rebbe, whatever, all the Rebbeim, right? They all were different students of the Magid who then went to their own communities, became, got, had Hasidim, many, many followers of Hasidim teaching Hasidis in a slightly different way. They had their own take, their own Hasidis. I mean, it was all the same source, but everyone has their own flavor, right? Their own, but their, they, it takes on the shape of their vessel. So the al Rebbe took it differently than most of them though. Um, so the al Rebbe who took it to the next level. Whereas the Baal Shem Tov, again, revealed, revealed not the intellectual names of God and the le levels of the world. He didn't say, you know, there's higher levels. They would just say, there, you know, there's there's worlds, other worlds, and all of the angels in the higher worlds are dancing when you say, Amin Yehishmi Rabba, when you say this, right? He wouldn't go into explaining the word making of the world because that was not some, a secret that was meant to be shared. You would just say, just so you know, it means a lot to your mom when you go bring her card. I'm not going to tell you your mom's whole therapy, right? What she told me, confidence. I'm just going to say, like, as a friend, I just want you to know how much it means to your mom when I do that, right? And that would imbue them with chayas, with joy, with feelings of, um, with, um, with, with a big vigor and a, and a push to connect with Hashem and to know that this is about a connection with Hashem. I'm not just a checklist Jew. This is about me having a relationship with Hashem. Um, al Rebbe, let me pause for a moment. <laughs> Then came so what happened with Alter Rebbe is that he shifted a lot and um, took a little took an, took it in a different direction. Where the Alter Rebbe realized and decided to do something that no his teacher before him and a teacher before him hadn't done, and he decided to share all of the wellsprings <laughs> to say I'm just gonna unload everything and tell you everything. I'm not no, I'm not gonna hold back. So everything that my teacher and teacher before him held back and we were very specific in exactly what to share and taught us what we could share and not share. I think that it's time that I just let the floods loose share everything and he began to share and share and share Hasidus long discourses of things that had never been shared before from the time of Moshe Rabbeinu until 250 years ago and his com colleagues were so many of them were um, were opposed to him strongly very strongly opposed and they said he's gone rogue he's like a rogue Hasidic student he has to be like stopped at all costs. Mm -hmm. So even his own colleagues were really upset. They're like, no, these are secrets for a reason. These are God's secrets. You don't just go and spill God's secrets that he told you in confidence, right? There's a reason that they're secrets. And there's a reason that it's called Sod in the parties, right? And so that is when Valtrebi was imprisoned. 
Um, and when he was in prison, in jail, this is the famous like Chabad, Yat Kislev, the prison of <coughs> Rebbe, was in this time when he was starting to spread Tanya and teach, that's when he began teaching Tanya. It wasn't written as a book called Tanya. Tanya is actually just the first word of the book. He was just saying many, many specific discourses, starting from the beginning, from A to Z and saying everything. And they were, um, he was writing them and having them sent out, um, delivered and, and printed over and over and given out to everybody so everyone could have access to this, like to everything that's been, like the floodgates opened. Um, and it actually, it says that he was in prison when somebody found a piece of it in the garbage, like in the garbage, it trampled on. Um, and they were like, look, this is what you're doing to the secrets of Hashem. So on Yutes Kislev, so when he was in prison, it says he was visited by the, he says that he was visited by his deceased Rebbe, Reb Magid, and the Baal Shem Tov, who he didn't recognize because he'd never met him, because the Baal Shem Tov made sure that they wouldn't meet, so that the Alter Rebbe, um, he had very specific instructions to that. He was in touch with the Alter Rebbe's parents. He cut his hair as Abtrinish, and he said, I never want you to bring him back to me because I want him to, if he comes to this, it should be from himself, that they, they should just raise him like a good litvak. And he on his own came to Chassidus because if he's influenced by me, then, you know, then it wouldn't be, it wouldn't be him, his own work. So that was, there's a lot, um, we can talk about another time. So the, um, while the altar was in prison, he took it as a clear sign that in heaven, he said, this is a clear sign that they want me to stop. That what I'm doing, when I, my rogue disseminating of Chassidus to the extent that I've done it, it has to stop because clearly in heaven they're stopping me obviously and that's what kabbalah is it's like everything that would it happens on here is a mirror of what's happening above he said if they were able to imprison me the 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 reason he was in prison is because his um misnagdim which are the uh, mitnaged people who opposed him the litvaks who opposed chassidus in general they opposed especially what he was doing they told lies to the russian government that he was um sending money to the turkish in israel and they found that he was sending money to israel but it was to the poor people in israel with this foundation called chabad that exists until today um, the same foundation that he started 250 years ago continues with the same name and still people around the world sending money that goes directly to thousands of meals for thousands and thousands of needy families, right? People who do um, pantry packers, that's called a chabad. Yeah. But they don't just do pantry packers, they do way more, but it's basically food for people in Israel. So he was sending money and they said he was sending money to for the Turkish government to rebel against him. So they, in the meantime, like, we don't know, we have to find out what it is, we'll put him in jail. And he said, listen, I'm, that's not why I'm in jail. I'm in jail because God let me be put in jail. God didn't want me to put in jail. When he put in jail, clearly above, they are not happy with what I am doing, teaching, revealing the secrets, right? Duh. Um, so in prison, he was appeared to by his teacher. And then what he later realized was the Baal Shem Tov who told him. And he said, oh, so do I have to stop teaching Chassidus to the extent I've been doing? Are they mad at me, right? And they said, no, um, there's a court case above and they're fighting it out. People people above or souls above or angels above. There's, there's, there's a lot of uproar above. They're like, oh, he gets to tell all the secrets. Like we didn't get to know it, but he gets to say it to everybody. Like, no way, this is not happening. There was a real court case going on above a din, but he, they said that you are going to, that's going to be come in your favor and you're going to be released. And on the day you're released, which is not very long, he was only in prison for 53 days. Now, um, 54 days. How many are you talking about? 50 something days. Um, he says, on the day that you're released, that's your sign from above that they have the green light to keep spreading. And you should not only keep spreading, but spread with much more than before. As so that's when he came out and he printed the Tanya. So this is really the history. Now we're going to talk about what is Hasid Chabad. So Hasid is the secrets of Kabbalah brought down in a way that any person, literate, illiterate, can understand these deeper secrets to the intentions of why Hashem made the world, the secret reasons that Hashem has in all the mitzvahs. And Chazidus Chabad said it's not enough just to have the emotions, right? So this is this is where we get into the words. So um, Chasidut, Chas, by the way, Chasid is a pious person because many times pre, before Chasidim existed, the word Chasid existed many times in halacha. I would say a person should do this and a Chasid should do this. Someone who's extra pious, right? It's like you're the ultra frummies to do this, right? If you're like, want to keep the letter of the law, then, you know, do this. And if you're ultra religious, so it's like the ultra, that's like, if you're very pious, meaning if you want to keep the next level, the highest level, then you should do this. So chassidus meant someone who goes beyond the letter of the law, beyond. So that's what it meant to be a chassid. And the chassid nowadays means a follower, like a, uh, I guess not a follower, but um, there's a lot of people say, what is a chassid, right? I always say a chassid is a lamplighter. So a chassid, meaning what, what we're expected to be. And we say, what is a chassid? We say a chassid is a pini, someone who's present, someone who's doing what he's doing, and that's what he's doing. So a chassid is a lamplighter, someone who spends their whole life lighting up souls, the lamps, the souls that are already there. So chassid is many things. But in the literal term, chassidus is, um, it's hard to explain, yeah, is the is the teaching, the inner teachings. Chabad chassidus, okay, this is where we get to the um, these concepts that we talk about a lot. We get to the spheros. Um, we have 10... <laughs> 
Chabad is an acronym for Chachma Bina Das, the three intellectual faculties. We learn that we're created as a mirror of God. And just like God created the world through the 10 spherot, the seven emotive, um, seven emotion, emotive powers and three intellectual powers, within us, we have seven emotive um, energies or kochos or powers in our soul and three intellectuals. And Chabad is an acronym for the three intellectual ones, Chachma, um, wisdom, um, Bina, understanding that wisdom, and Das, connecting to that wisdom. So Chachma, Bina, Das, Chabad, right? Chabad. That's where Chabad came from. Why are we called Chabad Hasidis? Because the Alter Rebbe did something that they didn't do. They just taught, they were called, if you ever see like um, the term Chagas, if not many people are familiar with the term Chagas. Chagas Hasidim were everyone besides the Chabad people, basically. They taught Chabad, Chagas, which is the three main emotive Hasidis, Chesed, abundance, flow, light, love, Gvura, which is Yira, fear, awe, right? It's boundaries. So Chesed is when you have nonstop, no boundaries, love, love without end, right? Um, no, no boundaries. Gavura is boundaries, and Tiferes, which is a harmony of both. Har- harmony of both. It's mercy. It's balance. So Tiferes is balance. Those are the three main emotions. All other emotions come from those. If we would make a list of every emotion that exists, it would be on from right. And that's really how we describe it. There's negative emotions not, not to do things. Then there's positive emotions to do things. Right to move outwards, moving inwards. Right extroversion, introversion, boundaries, and moving in, moving out. And then Tiferes, which is balance, which is harmony, which is sim- sim- synthesis. Um, so we have Chagas Hasidim. So everyone besides the Alter Rebbe, what they taught wasn't the secrets, actually. It was the emotion that was the point of the secrets. Because really, Chabad, our intellect, is only there to give birth to emotions in, as it relates to connecting to God. We meditate on a godly idea, on Enon Movado, there's nothing but God, in order that that gives us love for Hashem or awe, like an awesomeness, and say, well, I've got to serve, i got to do what he does. Like he created the whole world, right? If we think and meditate on the greatness of God and how he created every single thing, and he's the creator of the world, like Avram Avinu, that led him to emotion to say, wow, like I should probably find out, you know, I'm in awe. I need to know more about this God. And that leads to action. So thought ultimately leads to emotion, creates emotion. Either if I think and I hear lots of bad things about somebody, it's going to lead me to have negative emotions towards them. If I hear great things about somebody, it's going to lead me to want to meet them. And that emotion will lead to action, to something I want to do, to a desire to want to do something. So thought leads to emotion, leads to action, right? Mahshava, dibor, speech, or emotion leads to action. Um, so the, the purpose of all the thought, all of the higher seeks of the Torah to lead us to have Avan Yerah for Hashem, because our mitzvahs and our connection to Hashem shouldn't just be a checklist of things that we do, it should be inspired and fueled by love for God, for gratitude for God, by awe of God and saying, well, listen, sometimes I don't do things because I love them, right? There's some mitzvahs, but I do them because like I'm in awe, God made the world, he probably knows better than me, so I'm just going to trust him on this one, right? That's what I say, like Lois, I say, like, I don't get this mitzvah, there's many mitzvahs that are beyond me that I will do differently, but I'm not God, right? And that's why I didn't create the world. <laughs> um, so in short, as we wrap up for today, um, we learned what Kabbalah is, it's the secrets of the Torah. Hasidus is revealing those secrets, but only the emotive parts of those secrets. For example, Breslov focuses mostly on Yesh, on, um, on hope, on Amuna, right? The main core, the garden of Amuna, on having Amuna in Hashem. So you don't necessarily need to know the secrets of how Hashem made the world to believe in Him. You want to inspire Amuna and say like, right? There's to always believe, to have faith, to have pure trust in Hashem. So they focus on the chagas, on the emotion that comes from the intellect, because that is the ultimate goal. And there are other sects of Siddim that focus on, on, on Ava, on outward expression of love to Hashem, right? There's those that focus on Ava, there's those that focus on Achdos, there's those that focus on Amuna, and all different great positive emotions that come from the Chabad, from the intellect, that they know. We're like, we know the secrets, we're the rabbis, right? The Nachman of Reslov, he was aware of all of the highest secrets of the world. But he's like, I'm not going to tell you those secrets because they're a secret, but I will tell you how much you could trust. Trust me and know that Hashem is involved with everything. I'm not going to prove to you and tell you the makeup of it and how it works and the letters of Hashem's and the combinations, but I will tell you that there is, you can have full Amunah and Hashem and to inspire you every day to wake up and have Amunah. And that's what Breslov, right? That's what Nachman Breslov inspires in all of, in all of, in all of his followers and all those who study his Hasidus, Hagas. But the Altar Rabbi said, but what happens in those circles, all of those Hasidim, what happened was is that the stories, all the old stories that we have, about Hasidim, or Hasidim who left their wife for the whole Tishrei and still do and disappear. Why do the brass lovers go every year to Rabbi Nachman to sustain their Amuna? Because they don't know the secrets Rabbi Nachman does and through him, he's sustaining them. He is the one sending, he's the, the Sadiq that's giving them. It says, um, Chadiz, Sadiq, Bemunasai, Yichyeh. Um, and they said, Al Tikra Yichyeh, Ela Yichayeh. 
Tzadik Bununa say this is a Pasuk, and he says, a Tzadik, through his Amuna, he and he, 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 he gives life to others. So they need to go back. If those Hasidim didn't go back every year to the Rebbe, at least once a year, twice a year, then their Amuna would start to wave, waver, and they had to go back to the Rebbe to be remember why they need to have Amuna, to be re-inspired and come back with the barrels of Hasidus and inspiration, right? When our husbands or your husbands come back from um, from Tish, from, from um, people's husbands come back from Rabbi Nachman and Elul, um, and Tishrei, then they come back with Amuna for the whole year. But the Alter Rebbe said, listen, why don't I just give you what I have? Instead of you having come back to me every few times a year, it's not sustainable. You're leaving your wives and kids, right? How are you going to come back? There's not enough, enough room here. He's like, I think that what we really need is the wellspring itself. What the Baal Shem Tov meant is not just to have the water, the emotion, the Amuna. Take the whole wellspring itself. Learn it yourself. You do the intellect yourself. You do the hard work. And that way you can, on your own, sustain yourself with, the, with Amuna. You don't need to do... And he that, that exchange between... I think it was Rav Abram of, I don't want to say Kaliska or Karlin, there was an exchange between them and they were arguing about whether or not he's allowed to teach this. And he said, no, it's not Yechia, Chaya. It's Yechia, that you on your own, everyone has to sustain their own Amuna. You have to be able to go back and when you're feeling like your Amuna is not strong enough and Hashem, your trust is wavering and you're all over the place and you feel like life is a chaotic um, it's, it's, it's cycle, right? And the world is dark and scary. You need to go into the text and learn yourself, inspire yourself, right? Use your meditation cards. My friend Jenna, I could link these. She made these incredible meditation cards. If you're feeling disconnected, recenter, take a teaching, a short teaching, right? You know, to, um, to think about. Breathe it in your body, feel it in your whole body, and then reconnect on your own. You don't have to come back here and take the trip and sell your horse and your house and your s robe so you can afford to come back to your Rebbe and leave your wife in case so that you could be re-inspired. I'll just tell you what inspires me to inspire you. You do it yourself. And that way, and he, um, Al-Drabi also wrote all this in his introduction to Tani. He said, the reason I'm writing this is because I'm not going to be around forever. And as it is now, I don't have time to meet with every chassid with all our own issues. And he's like, I'm just going to write in a book. And every and he said, in the Tanya, I'm going to include every answer to any question that any of my chassidim will ever have, not just my chassidim now, but in the future, anyone in the future who will ever connect to chassidists, all of their future questions will be answered in this book of Tanya. And he promised this. And he said, I know a book doesn't answer everyone's questions because it's individualized. A book is not written by everybody. He said, but this book will. This is a different type of book. He said, this book is going to include the secrets of everything. The secrets, the secret of everything. So this book will answer any question you'll ever have. So you don't have to come back to me with and have lines and lines and wait for months to get an audit to me because physically I'm limited and I don't have enough physical time to meet with every one of my chassidim because his list of chassidim were growing. who wanted his counsel and guidance. And he said, I'm just going to write down all the answers. These are the answers I give everybody and he's a chapter on depression a chapter if you're depressed because you're so you feel like you're a bad person a chapter if you're depressed because you actually have suffering in your life a chapter on every type of depression that there is on joy a chapter on amuna a chapter on your soul on your spirit eight chapters on your spiritual anatomy chapters on your relationship with food anything and the truth is is that if you really look at Tanya there really is there's never been a question I had that I didn't find the answer to eventually um, and he says, and if you can't find the answer in Tanya, that's fine. Right? Not everyone is literate. That's why there's Mashpiyam, right? There's teach, go to someone who is knowledgeable in Tanya and they'll teach it to you. And he says, they, nobody should be um, falsely humble and say, oh, I'm not the one to teach it to you. He said, um, you can teach it. Anyone who has any knowledge can teach Tanya, right? Don't be humble and say, oh, I'm not a good enough teacher. Someone asks you to teach, you teach them Tanya, right? You teach them the secrets. So, and, and people can learn, oh, now there's so many Baruch Hashem. When I, when I started learning Tanya, there was one translation and you needed a dictionary for it. <laughs> it was like a very hard to follow translation. And now, thank God, there's um, Practical Tanya. I actually wrote, a, I was planning on publishing a book that I had kids, so it's still unpublished, but it's on my computer, like summaries of the Tanya, so people can all access it. Um, it's, it has to be edited and published, and much more than just published one day. Um, stay tuned for Tanya for Dummies. You heard it first here. Um, Tanya 101, Tanya for Dummies. Um, so the so Tanya was taking the secrets them, 